Hello, everybody, and welcome to Des Moines University's mini medical school, week number two, Understanding and Building Vaccine Confidence During the COVID-19 Pandemic by Dr. Margaret Brazier from Pfizer. My name is Hannah DeGeest. I am the Community and Public Affairs Manager at DMU, and I am your host for this series. So in honor of Valentine's Day being this weekend, I thought that I would wear red just to give some of you an early reminder that it is coming right up. So I hope you enjoy this evening's lecture. And if you have any questions about DMU, please direct them my way. And thank you for joining us. Dr. Margaret Fraser received her Bachelor of Science degree from Purdue University. She then received her MD and completed her residency in neurology at Indiana University. Dr. Fraser is currently a physician in Pfizer Medical Affairs Vaccine Division. She still has a practice outside of Pfizer in which her subspecialty interest is neuroimmunopathological disorders. She has been with Pfizer for 20 years in different therapeutic areas. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fraser. My name is Meg Fraser. Welcome so much to this new discussion about vaccine confidence. So one of the things we've been trying to do is move away from the concept of vaccine hesitancy, which is more negatively thought of, into a more positive connotation of vaccine confidence. And you can see from this slide the overview of what we're going to talk about today. From attitudes, why confidence is important, we're going to take a look at vaccine rates and trends. And I think most importantly, we're going to talk about the vaccine development process in the context of a pandemic and then how we might go about building vaccine confidence. So I think this slide is a very important slide. And this WHO 10 Threats to Global Health predates the pandemic. And I think that's an important concept to, to consider you'll see that vaccine hesitancy was ranked in the top 10 at number eight, even before the pandemic reared its ugly head. I think that there is a number of misperceptions about what herd immunity means and doesn't mean, and we'll be visiting that in several slides going forward. I wanna take a look at the diseases on this slide. And when you think about it, have we ever really naturally achieved herd immunity with any of the more significant illnesses? And the answer is no. So if you think about smallpox and diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, we know that those caused significant morbidity and mortality. And native immunization, natural immunization, natural herd immunity would not have occurred, never have occurred. And we know that the only way we have achieved herd immunity is through vaccination. And I'm gonna be talking about measles, an example in a little bit. So what is herd immunity? If you look at the top bar on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see a naive population. So those are individuals who have no prior underlying immunity to the infectious disease, whatever that happens to be. And we are using the concept of an R naught, which means how many people one individual could conceivably infect. And for COVID-19, we're thinking it's three to four, it could be higher. And as the, as the virus mutates, it may be higher yet. But anyway, if you look at the third, three to four, R naught of three to four, you can see that very quickly, a naive population will become infected. If you look at the bottom graph on the left-hand side, that's where 70% of the population is immune. That one infected person has a much more difficult road to achieve infecting others. And that's what we're shooting for. We're shooting for unsuccessful transmission of that one infected individual. So if you look at graph A, graph A looks at the R naught on the x-axis, which is your measure of infectivity. So the farther right you go, the more infectious the disease might be. And then on the y-axis, you have the herd immunity threshold, which means that the more infectious the disease, the higher the herd immunity needs to be to prevent transmission. 
and if you look at the graph in B, you'll see different diseases arranged on the x-axis from H1N1 influenza, which had a relatively low R0, all the way to the measles virus, which had an R0 of 15. Measles is very, very infectious. So for every one person that's infected, they can infect 15 other people if they have not been immunized. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. So measles I mentioned was an example I was going to use. Measles virus is still around. If we don't maintain our immunizations, measles will very quickly get a foothold. In early 2019, late 2018, there was a measles, a small mini measles epidemic in New York City in a population that for religious reasons did not immunize. It quickly took foothold it infected several thousand people in a very short period of time, about two weeks. That gives you an idea of the fact that you needed to achieve for measles a 95% vaccination rate. So clusters of susceptible hosts that frequently contact one another can give one another an infection if they're not immunized. So again, this is another way to take a look at the same thing. But it's important to note that if you have a herd immunity, the virus will fail to spread. That doesn't mean that the virus doesn't exist in the environment, but it will fail to spread if an adequate number of people are immunized. Vaccination is necessary in just about every case when you think about true viral illness or really bacterial illness when you think of pertussis. If you think about COVID-19 specifically, and there have been a lot of people who have said, well, why don't we just let everybody get ill with it and then we'll be done with it? Well, nothing could be further from the truth from us for several reasons. One is that if we go back and look at the seropositivity data in the United States in October, it was less than 10%. We think that you need to have maybe 70% or a little more herd immunity in the United States to shut down COVID. So we were nowhere close in October. But I think the other thing that should give everyone pause is to reach herd immunity threshold naturally, meaning everyone would need to be ill, would require almost 2 million deaths in the United States and 30 million deaths globally. And that's just not a toll that anyone could possibly take. That's one component. But the other component is if that virus has a significant mutation, then perhaps that natural herd immunity would not hold. Flu vaccination coverage is an important thing to consider. And, and the reason why is because there's a great opportunity for improvement. And there has been a thought that flu vaccination coverage may herald what would be COVID-19 vaccination coverage. And it has been improving every year and it's much better this year. So the word got out early that we need to have a flu vaccine coverage for as many people as possible so that we could limit flu vaccination or we could limit the flu disease state from inundating hospitals right along with COVID-19. I think this is an important survey. So from September to December of 2020, there was an improvement in those individuals who felt that they would likely get a COVID-19 vaccine. So if you go back to September, only about 34% would definitely get it and another 29% would probably get it. And that has improved substantially to December, 2020. It really still needs to be better yet. There are some key determinants of confidence in vaccines. There are a number of them with trust probably being the most significant. Attitudes and beliefs are a small group of individuals. Healthcare provider confidence is very, very important and the ability to communicate about vaccines. And finally, the information environment. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but many people are getting their information horizontally rather than vertically. And sometimes that horizontal information environment can lead to misinformation. 
attitudes are really a continuum when it comes to vaccination. There are the pure rejectors, which are a relatively small group, somewhere under 10%. There are the true acceptors who accept without any question. And then there are a lot of people who are in the middle who are willing to listen about vaccines. There are late vaccinators who are primarily parents who are concerned that perhaps their children are getting an overload of vaccine at once. And so they want to delay those vaccines. They want them to only have a few vaccines at a time. Those are individuals who are very willing to hear more about vaccines. Vaccine confidence really refers to trust. It refers to trust that parents and healthcare providers have in all of the recommended immunizations and in the providers who administer in the vaccines and all of the processes that lead up to vaccination. And one of the things that I hope to help you understand in, during the course of this discussion is the safety message around vaccination and trust being that key foundation. So I wanna talk a little bit about communication. When I say communication is more horizontal, communication is more coming from social media, coming from groups that people are members of in, term, in Facebook. There has been a huge change in terms of the speed of information exchange. And there's a lot of competing noise. There is a lot of competing information that is a challenge for the scientific community. I often say that the misinformation cycle comes out, it's almost like playing whack-a-mole, trying to defeat each misinformation cycle as it arises. When I speak about misinformation on social media, I, I want you to think about something. When you Google something, you put in perhaps vaccine adverse events in your Google window, your search window. You will get a lot of information about vaccine adverse events. The next time you go in to type vaccine, you're very likely to get more negative information. So that confirmation bias exists in social media for all of us. It also helps to spread those misperceptions, that misconception, that misinformation, because the groups for which we have a membership also are those groups that confirm whatever bias it is that we might have, again, about any topic. And so unfortunately, much of what happens happens very quickly on social media without an opportunity to check the validity of that information. So let me talk about the unprecedented situation we have been in, the unprecedented acceleration of vaccine development and the need for unprecedented transparency. So let's start with the FDA. The FDA created and posted guidance very specific to COVID-19 vaccine requirements for the EUA and the EUA is emergency use authorization. We'll talk about what that means in a minute as well. The FDA spelled out very specifically the efficacy, safety, and manufacturing requirements, as did a committee called VERBAC, which is a committee that looks at vaccines and other biologic products, many of which are used for autoimmune diseases. And that committee is independent, and they look at all of this data as well. There are a number of eyes, in other words, taking a look at the data that comes in from any mac vaccine manufacturer. And as you'll see late in our discussion, we have a number of safety programming in, in place that's been present predating COVID-19 and concurrent through COVID-19. What about the CDC? The CDC has been openly evaluating the scientific data and in fact, really in a first ever, they have been putting our scientific data out for the public to see as soon as it's been presented to them and as soon as they've had an opportunity to digest that data. And they will also continue to monitor and evaluate all safety information coming in as it's being utilized in the real world. And what about vaccine manufacturers? Really for the first time ever, we have posted our protocol. So we have posted what we have been doing in our study trials, showing you what happens with subjects 
both those individuals who receive the treatment and those, uh, those uh, individuals who receive placebo. It's been a very transparent study enrollment process. We have let individuals in the public domain understand our minority recruitment, for example, our pediatric recruitment numbers, and all interim results in our clinical trials, all of those interim results, which were pre-specified before the trial started, were evaluated by independent review committees. So independent in our case of Pfizer. And then lastly, CEOs of nine vaccine manufacturers signed an historic pledge back in September, indicating that safety and well-being of all individuals was the top priority in, in, in terms of development. And much of that came about because there was a very novel circumstance that occurred during this pandemic, and that was the politicalization of vaccine development. So what has been the goal? The goal has been that we have a pandemic, which we need to address. We need to address it in the quickest way possible without compromising safety or product quality and ensuring vaccine efficacy. All at the same time of meeting very rigorous regulatory standards. And I think the public needs to understand what that pandemic paradigm looks like and the fact that no safety corners were ever cut from the development perspective in taking a look at the evaluation of each of these vaccines and that the strict regulatory requ requirements coming down from the government were never short-circuited. So let's take a look at vaccine development. On the top line, you have the traditional paradigm. And on the bottom line, you have a pandemic paradigm. And this pande pandemic paradigm is not novel to 2020. So after SARS-CoV-1 came about around 2002, the Bush administration put together a pandemic preparedness team to take a look at what would happen when additional pandemics arose. And we certainly have had a number of those that have occurred since then. Some have been less concerning than others or less concerning to the United States when you think about either Ebola, which was remarkably concerning for those individuals in the regions and geographies for which it was responsible, but also the Middle Eastern respiratory virus, which still goes on today. So the traditional paradigm takes many years and it's done in sequential fashion. Each phase is completed before the next phase is entered. From R&D and preclinical all the way through licensure. And manufacturing scale up is done very gradually. Large scale manufacturing is not done until very late. And why is that? Well, because a company would not put forth all of their resources early on when a probability of success from that early phase one is very, very low. You have a very low probability of success that you're ever going to be able to bring that product to licensure. Why would you ever put all of your resources up front and do it all at once? In a pandemic, however, all of the steps are done concurrently. After that R&D preclinical phase, when you actually have a vaccine that you think might be appropriate in this case, that you want to roll into phase one, which is the first in man type of study. In this case, we did phase one very quickly, phase two and three concurrently, and you can see that large scale manufacturing started very, very early in phase two and early phase three. And phase three for our vaccine began on July 27th. And currently we're under an emergency use authorization. We do not have full licensure that yet. That would come after a biologic license application occurs. So there are a number of key considerations and we're gonna talk about each of these blocks here in this slide. So what is an emergency use authorization? It can be utilized and declared when there is a public health emergency. 
it allows for unapproved medical products to be used in this emergency situation when there are no other alternatives. So there are no available approved adequate alternatives. It's all about benefit risk. Does the benefit of this treatment or potential treatment outweigh the risk given the complexity of the illness at play? There are many, many requirements that must be met for the FDA to determine that the benefits outweigh the risks in this circumstance. And what about the ACIP? So the ACIP stands for Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. This committee is an independent committee and they advise the CDC on what to do when it comes to vaccines. They have been meeting and they are the ones who met in early December to finally create the recommendations for the COVID-19 vaccinations. What about prioritization and distribution? There is a lot of discussion about that in the public domain. I think we have all recognized that. When you have a limited supply, which we do at present, then there's going to be an advocation that some groups be recommended to get the vaccine first before others, and that it be a tiered approach. And that tiered approach was decided upon through a number of different groups, Health and Human Services, the CDC, ACIP, and the Department of Defense from a distribution perspective. In addition, the FDA and the CDC reached out to the State Departments of Health and said, we want to know what you would like to do in each state, recognizing that each state would have different requests and different needs for numbers of uh, vaccines and where those vaccines should be distributed. And in terms of safety surveillance, that surveillance of safety is a top priority in the United States and globally. And there are a number of vaccine monitoring systems that are already been, have been in place for all vaccines and will continue for COVID-19 with additional ones added. There are a number of partners working on safety and surveillance. And what about licensure? Full licensure occurs after all regulatory commitments have been met and that's an ongoing process. So for example, the subjects in our studies are being followed for two years from the time that they entered the study. So that two years worth of data will be presented to the FDA in real time. So there have been a number of considerations that the ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, have considered, has considered for allocation of the vaccine. So there's the science, where is the disease burden? What types of individuals does this disease affect more than others? and then again balance the benefit and harm of the vaccine. Then the values of the target group and the feasibility of distributing the vaccine to that target group. And finally, the ethics. So how do you promote justice? How do you mitigate health inequities? And we know that health inequities are very, very important, particularly in this disease. We know that communities of color, for example, have a worse outcome when it comes to COVID-19 in part due to their socioeconomic status and in part due to other features native to communities of color? And how do we promote transparency so that we can improve individuals' confidence? So we're gonna talk about each phase just very briefly to give you an idea of what has gone into the tiering process for vaccine allocation. So again, in phase 1A, you have healthcare personnel frontline healthcare workers primarily, but those who provide medical services in general. And the reason why they were first is because we need them to be able to continue working in the face of a continuous pandemic where people are still ill. And then long-term care facility, both the residents and those individuals who work within long-term care. Unfortunately, that's been a bit slower from a long-term care facility perspective than we had hoped. Phase 1B, and I should make a comment here that every state is a little bit different than the others. 
in terms of how they are following this guidance. The state departments of health are determining what their state, what each individual state should be doing. So phase 1B, persons 75 years and older, as well as all of those who are frontline essential workers who cannot necessarily social distance or work from home. So these are individuals who cannot safely sequester themselves. They have to be out there in the public. We need to have them vaccinated. And then phase 1C, those individuals over age 65 or those individuals in Pfizer's case age 16, in Moderna's case age 18 to 64 who have high risk medical conditions. And those are many, many people in the United States. And then all the other essential workers that you can see there, individuals who are involved in food service and transportation, people who are involved in public safety. So emergency use authorization will have been determined after certain characteristics have been met. And one additional thing that I would like to comment here is that in a traditional vaccine time paradigm, you might have 30 to 60,000 subjects in that study, and it takes a long time to enroll all those individuals. In the case of our study, 44,000 people, there were 44,000 subjects enrolled in our study. So right in the middle between that 40 and six, or that 30 and 60,000 subject grouping. So the EUA could be considered when you had clinical studies of 30,000 plus subjects. So that gives you an additional idea of how many people were involved. In addition, the FDA wanted 60 days worth of safety data, which was presented on in our case in November, 60 days worth of safety data in at least half of the subjects in the study. And all of the data regarding manufacturing prop procedures needed to be appropriate so that they could make sure that the quality was maintained. And then subsequently, the CDC, in addition to the FDA, would evaluate the data. And the independent ACIP, that independent committee, would also evaluate the data. And the FDA has their independent arm, the VRBAC, that was also taking a look at the data. And so it's important to note that after EUA, phase three studies will continue as I already mentioned, and there will be more safety data for larger numbers of patients and in special populations as well. So this gives you an idea of all of the monitoring systems that are in place. The Vaccines Adverse Event Reporting System has been present for all vaccines. It's very important, it's ongoing. It is the very early warning system that helps the government understand what and where the problems might exist following vaccination and anyone can report a vaccine related concern. There are vaccine safety data links. There are biologic effectiveness and safety systems. There is the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services data monitoring system. There is the FDA Sentinel initiative, which pertains really to all medications, not just vaccines, but they will take a look systemically at the electronic health record. They will query certain items around certain medications or certain disease states, and they will take a look at any potential adverse events that might be clustering around a disease state. And then we have expanded safety monitoring. We have vSafe, which is a text messaging program that is offered to everyone once they have been vaccinated with COVID-19 to take a look and be part of the follow-up. It involves an opportunity for them to electronically mention any side effects they are experiencing with respect to the vaccine. The FDA has a network where they can take a look at claims-based data in large databases. And then the CDC monitors long-term care facilities as well as acute care hospitals. But in this particular case, we'd be much 
more interested in what's happening with long-term care facilities and they're reporting into the vaccines adverse event reporting system. So again, many, many, many opportunities to be evaluating safety in real time. So I think it's important for healthcare providers to feel confident in vaccines. They're the ones that often are in the position to address misinformation and discuss benefits and risks. But that's true for really everyone. If they can be armed with true and appropriate information in an effort to culture prevention, to culture a confidence in vaccination. So now we're gonna take a look at what groups are most likely to be vaccinated what groups are not likely to get vaccinated and then why they would not likely get vaccinated. So these are the groups that would probably or definitely not get it. So younger people, ages 30 to 49, those people who live in rural residencies, those individuals from communities of color, particularly black and brown adults, followed by essential workers, alarmingly healthcare workers, and we're gonna talk about that subset of healthcare workers in a minute. And you go all the way down to the bottom where those individuals age 65 and over, those individuals who have a serious health condition and those individuals who live in an urban setting are more likely to get the vaccine. As you might imagine, there are different reasons in each of these different groups. So the reason for somebody who's age 30 versus somebody who is in a black and brown community are very different. For age 30, it's more along the lines of, you know what, I'm gonna be fine. If I get it, I'll be healthy. It's not a big deal. I don't necessarily wanna get a vaccination. I don't necessarily want to possibly have a side effect. So I'll just let that go versus an individual in a black and brown community who may have distrust of the healthcare community, the healthcare system, the vaccination process, how vaccinations come to be developed. Because of what happened during the course of 2020, there are a number of people who are not comfortable with the government being involved at all. There are people who are not confident with vaccine manufacturers. There's there are people who are not comfortable with transparency of, individ of information individually, which is one reason why I talked about the fact that there has been unprecedented transparency this particular go around with the vaccine development. I think again, what we're trying to fight is that very strong misinformation cycle. I think this slide in particular should give everyone pause, even those 30 year olds who don't feel that they need to be vaccinated. So you can see that each age group is being compared to individuals 18 to 29. 18 to 29 who are classically called the super spreaders. Those are the individuals who are often asymptomatic, who go to parties, who don't wear masks and then bring that home to their communities. But you can see what happens to hospitalization and death rates as you get older, and it's not a trivial increase. So even for those individuals in that 30 to 39 year group, the death rate is four times higher versus their younger friends, so 18 to 29. And if you jump to the 50 year old, that rate of death is 30 times higher Again, not a trivial comparison. And of course, as you go up further, that death rate goes up much higher. So I think this slide should get everyone pause when they contemplate the idea of vaccine immunization and they contemplate what we talked about early in the presentation about herd immunity and how we do not achieve herd immunity naturally in many, if any, infectious diseases. So let's take a look at age-adjusted hospitalizations and we're basing that on ethnic groups. 
I think the other thing that is important about this slide that if you look at communities of color compared with those white persons in the same age group, their risk of hospitalization is dramatically higher. Highest among those of American Indian or Alaskan native background, followed by those individuals who are black and brown and finally the Latin X population. There are a number of best practices. I think one of the most important though is to be transparent and honest. Stick to very, very specific key messaging and try your best not to continue to discuss the anti-vaccine arguments. This is a summary slide, but I'm going to go back and talk about some additional comments in a minute. But I hope that I have achieved an element of improvement in vaccine confidence, especially for COVID-19 vaccine. We know that COVID-19 vaccine confidence is important. We also know that since the pandemic began and the lockdowns occurred, started occurring in March, that we are behind in immunizations in general in this country, particularly in the pediatric population. And that is something that's very, very important. I'm going to hold this slide for just a minute. These are a number of selected resources so that if you have additional questions, you can go and take a look at them. I would point you toward the Immunization Action Coalition. They have wonderful materials that you can download and print, or you can even send for and will receive for free that, that are geared toward patients, they're geared toward healthcare providers, they're geared toward, geared toward the community at large. Wonderful information. The CDC Vaccinate with Confidence is also geared toward the community at large. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has some wonderful information geared more for parents and patients. The Pandemic Resources is the FDA government's website and I would have you take a look at that as well. So I mentioned that I wanted to kind of finish with some discussions about the healthcare provider community specifically. So I showed you that there was, they showed you that one slide that talked about people who might not or would not get the vaccine. And it was a bit startling to take a look at the percentage of individuals in the healthcare community who would not potentially get a vaccination. So if you look back at Actually, there was another survey done in the September timeframe. There was a survey done in the October timeframe. But before a lot of the vaccine efficacy data came out and before the safety data came out, when they interviewed the nursing population in September, 47% in September of nurses would not get vaccinated according to a national survey. In October, it improved somewhat but you still only had 14% of nurses being very confident in vaccine development processes. And roughly that same percentage in being very confident that the COVID-19 vaccine would be safe and effective. And I think the other concern was that nursing, and I also include medical assistants in this group when I'm talking about this group in particular, that they did not feel very knowledgeable about COVID-19 vaccination development or the vaccine itself. And the other concern was that if the employer did not require vaccination, they would not necessarily voluntarily vaccinate themselves. And this is a bit different from the flu vaccine where most of us as healthcare providers, and I still see patients outside of Pfizer, most of us are required to get a flu vaccination in order to practice medicine. So you can see back in October what the concerns of nurses were toward the vaccination. They were worried that the development was occurring too quickly. And again, as I mentioned, we have condensed our vaccine development. So yes, the vaccine development did occur very quickly, but it occurred very quickly because all phases of development were occurring at the same time versus sequentially. So no corners were cut no steps were skipped, all phases were approached, and adequate numbers of subjects were analyzed 
and we had good two month safety data. And some people may, may ask, why was the FDA interested in two months worth of safety data? Because most vaccine anticipated adverse events are going to occur in that two month period of time. I bring up this last slide, and this is my last slide, to talk about where people are getting their sources of information. And this is very alarming to me as a physician. And most people are getting their information from media. Now, there are, there are very trustworthy sources of media, and I don't want to paint a broad brush here, but you must also remember that media is going to jump on a story very quickly. So it can absolutely feed a misinformation cycle very quickly before validating the potentially that information and potentially looking at other independent sources to help them validate that information. And still people are getting their information from social media. So again, as I mentioned in the very, very beginning, social media is often very well funded. Their information looks very credible because sometimes they can have a scientific person or somebody who used to be in the scientific community as their spokesperson, but it's important to validate this misinformation before you turn around and spread that misinformation to another person. And again, finally recommend or remember that you may make your recommendations based on your own confidence and your confidence may come from your biases. And when we do Google searches, we confirm our own biases. So again, that's my final message. And hopefully you learned a little bit about what pandemic vaccine development looked like in 2020. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. I hope that you enjoyed that lecture just as much as I did. I hope that you'll join us next week for mini med school week number three. Dr. Rochelle Reimer is joining us and she is presenting on what has the COVID-19 pandemic taught us about public health and prevention behaviors. It's going to be another interesting week and I can't wait to see you again. See you later.